Hello everybody, welcome to Shaders Monthly. Today we will talk about important sampling of environment maps for image-based lighting. In the last three episodes we have already discussed image-based lighting and applied important sampling with respect to the BRDF to reduce the sampling noise. However, this is not always the best option, as you can see here. On the left you see the result of sampling the BRDF and on the right the result of sampling the environment map. What is the problem with sampling the BRDF? Here you see a surface patch that is surrounded by a spherical environment map. This yellow lobe here represents the BRDF, which is short for Bidirectional Reflection Distribution Function. For example, this could be a specular lobe of a Blin Fong or microfacet BRDF. In episode number 11 we learned that for real-time image-based lighting we generate the pre-filtered specular environment map by sampling the specular lobe around the reflected view direction. The reflected view direction is denoted by RV here. We pre-filter the environment map by generating random directions where we look up the radiance values that are stored in the environment map. The random directions are selected by important sampling with respect to the BRDF. This means that the sampling density is high when the BRDF values are high and the sampling density is low when the BRDF values are low. This works fine as long as the radiance values in the environment map do not contain high frequencies. For example, the red curve here specifies the radiance values and currently we get a little bit of radiance from everywhere. However, if the environment map contains high frequencies, such as small bright light sources, this will produce problems. As we see here, when we perform important sampling with respect to the BRDF, we might not hit the location of the bright light sources. In the random process, sometimes we hit these bright locations, sometimes not, and this produces a lot of noise in the output. In this episode, we learn how to perform important sampling with respect to the radiance values stored in the environment map. This means that the sampling density is high when the radiance values are high and the sampling density is low when the radiance values are low. With this new approach, we will not miss the locations of the bright light sources. On the other hand, in the rendering equation, which you will see on the next slide, the incoming radiance is multiplied by the BRDF. This means we do not gain much from our samples when the BRDF is small or almost zero. This is especially the case for smooth surfaces when the specular lobe is narrow. Therefore, this technique is especially suited for rough surfaces with a wide specular lobe. Furthermore, it is very useful in combination with the diffuse BRDF or the diffuse part of the BRDF. As we know from previous episodes of Shaders Monthly, The diffuse part of the BRDF is a constant. So this is a perfect use case for important sampling with respect to the environment map. Let's start to look into the math. Here is the rendering equation, which we have introduced and discussed in detail in episode number 4. The rendering equation calculates the outgoing radiance LO in the direction V for a surface patch at location X with normal N. The outgoing radiance is the sum of two terms. The first term is the emitted radiance Le in the direction V. This term is only larger than zero if the surface is a light source. The second term is the integral over the complete solid angle of the hemisphere above the surface. The solid angle around the light vector L is denoted by omega and is a variable of integration. Consequently, the omega denotes the differential solid angle. We integrate over the incoming radiance Li from the hemisphere above the surface patch. In our case, the incoming radiance Li is provided by the values in the environment map. An incoming radiance Li from direction L multiplied by cosine theta d omega generates an infinitesimal irradiance contribution dE. The infinitesimal irradiance contribution dE is multiplied by the BRDF. The BRDF defines how much radiance is reflected by the surface patch in direction V when it receives irradiance from direction L. This way the BRDF describes the material properties of the surface patch. 
the next refresher is a slide from episode number 10 about Monte Carlo integration. Using Monte Carlo integration and important sampling, we can approximate any integral by a sum. Here we have an integral from a to b of f of x dx. This integral is approximated by 1 over capital N, where capital N is the number of samples, times the sum over f of x n, which is a function value at the sampled x location, divided by p of x n. p of x is some arbitrary probability density function called PDF for short. The PDF must fulfill the condition that the integral from a to b of p of x dx is equal to 1. When we approximate the integral by sampling and sum up the contributions as denoted here, this gives us an unbiased estimator. The theory of important sampling states that the best PDF, which is the one for which the estimator has the lowest variance, would be p of x equals f of x divided by the integral from a to b f of x dx. This means that the sampling density should be high when the function values are high and the sampling density should be low when the function values are low. Let's apply Monte Carlo integration and important sampling to solve the integral in the rendering equation. So, here we have the integral from the rendering equation. We don't consider the emissive term Le here. The variable of integration is a solid angle omega, which is difficult to parameterize. Therefore, we represent the solid angle in spherical coordinates as discussed in episode number 4. These spherical coordinates are the polar angle theta and the azimuthal angle phi. Now we see in the figure that the size of a d phi step depends on theta. When theta equals 0, the contribution is 0, and for theta equal to 90 degrees, the contribution is a full d phi step. We must take this into account and use the factor sine theta to scale the d phi step accordingly. This is the resulting double integral of the two variables theta and phi. As we need to integrate of the hemisphere, theta goes from 0 to pi over 2, and phi goes from 0 to 2 pi. This formulation is only valid if the spherical coordinate system is aligned with the normal of the surface patch. This was the case with the examples in previous episodes of Shaders Monthly. In today's implementation, however, we will align the spherical coordinate system with the coordinate system of the environment map, which is the global world coordinate system. We integrate over the entire spherical environment map, and so theta goes from 0 to pi now. This is now a different coordinate system. Therefore, I have marked this theta in the cosine term with a hat to remind us that this theta is the angle between the normal and the incoming light direction. If this cosine term is negative, the light is hitting the surface from behind, and we should ignore it. So I have added a little plus here, which denotes the ramp function. The ramp function is zero for negative arguments. Now we use important sampling to solve this integral. The integrand f of phi and theta is the BRD f fr times the incoming radians Li times cosine theta hat times sine theta. We approximate the integral with the important sampling sum. We put in the integrand f of phi and theta, and now we can freely choose our PDF p of phi and theta. Today we want to choose our PDF to follow the incoming radiance function, Li. But how can we generate sampling positions according to a chosen PDF? One popular solution is inverse transform sampling. Many programming languages provide ready-made functions to generate uniformly distributed samples. With inverse transform sampling, it is possible to transform uniformly generated random numbers into random numbers with other PDFs. We have to follow the shown four steps. Step 1 computes the cumulative distribution function CDF for short from the probability density function PDF for short. By definition, the CDF capital P of x is computed by the integral of the PDF from minus infinity to x. Step 2 computes the inverse of the CDF. Step 3 generate uniformly distributed random values u in the interval from 0 to 1. Step 4 compute random numbers x according to p of x using the inverse of the CDF. Our PDF has two dimensions, phi and theta, which make things more complicated. 
Fortunately, inverse transform sampling can also be used for a two-dimensional PDF. We need to follow the shown recipe. Step 1. Given a two-dimensional PDF, P of X and Y, calculate the marginal PDF for one dimension, for example for Y. The marginal PDF of Y is equal to the integral over the joint PDF, P of X and Y, dx, over the whole domain of the X dimension. This is illustrated in the figure here. The two-dimensional PDF, P of X and Y, is visualized here as a 2D height field. The two marginal PDFs for Y and for X are shown here as a graph. If we want to know the marginal PDF PY of Y for a certain Y location, the value of X does not matter and we need to accumulate all the joint PDFs of the X dimension for a certain Y location. We can imagine that we squeeze the 2D distribution onto the 1D Y axis. Step 2 computes the conditional PDF for the other dimension. The conditional PDF P of X given Y is equal to the joint PDF divided by the PDF of the conditioning event, which is the marginal PDF PY of Y. In the figure we can visualize a graph that is proportional to the conditional PDF P of X given Y by selecting some conditioning Y value. Then we follow the shape of the joint PDF over the X direction for a fixed given Y position. Step 3. Use the known inverse transform sampling method from the previous slide for the two 1D PDFs PY of Y and PX given Y. Basically, we use the marginal PDF PY of Y to sample a Y value, and with the known Y value, we use the conditional PDF P of X given Y to sample the X value. In our implementation, we will use a spherical environment map, which is also called a latitude-longitude map. It is given as a 2D texture. As we have learned in episode number 5, we can define a location in the texture with texture coordinates S and T, which are both in the range from 0 to 1. When the T coordinate of the texture goes from 0 to 1, the polar angle theta goes from pi to 0. Consequently, the mapping is pi times 1 minus t. For the other muzzle angle phi, the choice of the origin is a matter of taste. I have chosen the origin of phi to be at the center of the image. When the s coordinate goes from 0 to 0 0.5 to 1, phi goes from pi to 0 to minus pi. Therefore, the mapping is 2 pi times 0 0.5 minus s. The equations for important sampling, which we use later, are simpler if we perform the sampling in the st domain instead of the phi theta domain. However, as you can see here, there is a simple linear relation between texture coordinates and spherical coordinates. To perform this change of coordinate systems, we need to talk about transformations of probability densities from one domain to another. If a multidimensional random variable vector x, which is here a vector of several dimensions, is mapped by a multidimensional bijective function f to a vector y, it follows that the joint PDF of the vector y is 1 over the determinant of the Jacobian matrix times the joint PDF of the vector x. The Jacobian matrix is built by computing the partial derivatives of the mapping functions for the different dimensions of the vector y with respect to the dimensions of the vector x. This sounds complicated, but in our case it turns out to be quite simple. We know the relationship between texture coordinates s and t and spherical coordinates phi and theta. The partial derivative of phi with respect to s is minus 2 pi. The partial derivative of phi with respect to t is 0 because phi is not a function of t. The partial derivative of theta with respect to s is 0. The partial derivative of theta with respect to t is minus pi. The determinant is this times this minus this times this. So the determinant of the Jacobian matrix is 2 pi squared. We can use this result for the important sampling of the rendering equation. Instead of using p of phi and theta here in the denominator, we use p of s and t, but we need the additional factor of 2 pi squared. So this is just a constant that we need to consider here. 
using texture coordinates instead of spherical coordinates will make things easier for us in the following. Here are the steps that we need to perform for the important sampling of environment maps. Step 1 convert the RGB environment image to grayscale. Step 2 computes the 2D PDF from the grayscale image. Step 3 calculate the marginal PDF for one dimension. Step 4 calculate the conditional PDF for the other dimension. Step 5 apply inverse transform sampling. Step 6 use the samples to evaluate the rendering equation. In the following, we will implement an OpenGL GLSL shader for each one of these steps. Step 1 convert the RGB environment image to grayscale. Our environment map has three color channels red, green, and blue. We could perform our approach on each channel separately, but that would take three times longer to compute. Therefore, we convert the environment map to grayscale and use the grayscale value as our incoming radiance. In episode number 4, we talked about the sRGB color space and that we need to perform gamma expansion to get linear RGB values. In this linear RGB space, the linear luminance is calculated as the weighted sum of the linear RGB values as shown here. Let's implement this first step as a GLSL shader. We use the GSN composer at gsn-lib.org as our shader editor. The GSN Composer is a web-based tool that I created especially for teaching shader programming. But you can use any other shader editor as well. We write pure OpenGL GLSL code which you can use anywhere. Links to examples that execute the same shader code using C++ or Java can be found in the video description. The implementation is based on the examples that we developed in episodes 10, 11 and 12. In these examples, we compute a pre-filtered environment map by important sampling with respect to the BRDF. Click on Project and type in the name of the previous project, Shaders Monthly 12, and click on Open Existing. Then open the graph Pre-Filter Diffuse and press Play in the Time Control panel. This is the shader that computes a pre-filtered environment map. Let's set samples to 1000, the width and height to 1024 by 512, which is the size of the input image, and mid-map level to 0. We see some sampling artifacts. However, for this environment map, the incoming radiance does not have strong peaks. If we increase the number of samples, we can get rid of the sampling artifacts. 2000, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9000. And the problem is solved. But let's look at this environment map, which contains high frequencies. For example, this window, which emits bluish green light, or the street lamp, which emits orange light. Increasing the number of samples does not help much. 2000, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9000. So in the past we increased the mid-map level to smooth out the high frequencies from the input. Mid-map level 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. But this is not a good solution because the light sources start to change their location. Ok, let's focus on the task at hand. In the first step, we have to convert the RGB environment image to grayscale. Let's clone the shader. You see here that this shader uses a plane mesh as input. The plane mesh consists of a single quad represented by two triangles. We select the shader node and click the Edit Code button. This dialog is the shader editor of the GSN Composer. In the top section we can define the vertex shader and in the bottom section the fragment shader. You see here in the vertex shader that we don't apply any transformation to the vertex positions. This way we are rendering a screen size quad. With this trick we use the OpenGL pipeline to perform 2D image processing instead of drawing a 3D scene. Now all our processing is done in the fragment shader. 
Its main function is called for every pixel of the rendered triangles. So in our screen size quad setup it is called for every pixel of the output image. VEC4 text color equals texture my texture interpolated text cohort. Out color equals text color. Apply code recompute. This gives us a copy of the input image. Float gray equals dot VEC3 0 0.2126, 0 0.7152, 0 0.0722, text color dot RGB. Out color equals VEC4 gray, gray, gray 1.0. Apply code recompute. Okay, now we have a grayscale image. It is a bit tedious to implement a vertex and a fragment shader in this situation because for image processing the vertex shader is always the same and we are only interested in the fragment shader. Since we are implementing several image shaders today, I would like to use another shader node that is available in the GSN Composer, which has the screen size quad setup already built in, so we don't need to copy the vertex shader and the input mesh every time. You can find this node under Image Processing, Compute, Plugin, Image Shader. We open the shader editor. Now you see here that we can only specify the fragment shader. I paste our fragment shader code from before. Delete this uniform variable, uncomment uniform sampler 2D input image. We replace my texture with input image. Furthermore, we see here that our interpolated text cohort are now called TC. We replace this as well. Apply and close. Ok, let's hook up the input image and set the width and height to 1024 times 512. Let's call this image shader grayscale. And we can delete the 3D shader here because we now have this cleaner option. Ok, step 1 done. Step 2 computes a 2D PDF from the grayscale image. Let's denote our continuous grayscale image by G of S and T. The image is parameterized in texture coordinates S and T. Both are in the range from 0 to 1. The image has S times T pixels and the square brackets G of X and Y denote access to the given pixel. We want to use the grayscale image as our 2D PDF. However, a PDF must fulfill the condition that the integral over the entire domain is equal to 1. So let's compute the 2D integral over the grayscale image. The texture coordinates S and T are in the range from 0 to 1. We can solve this integral using the Riemann sum, which we have discussed in episode number 10. We divide the S domain, which goes from 0 to 1, into capital S steps, so each delta S has the size of 1 divided by capital S. Same for delta T. We move these constants in front of the sum and we get this double sum here. We sum up all the pixel values of the 2D image and divide by the total number of pixels, which is S times T. This is nothing else than the average color of the image. We denote the image average by capital A in the following. It is just a single scalar value. If we divide G of S and T by the average A, we can use the result as our 2D joint PDF because the condition that the integral over the whole domain is equal to 1 is fulfilled. Now computing the image average using this double sum in a shader is not a good idea because we only compute a single output. This means that a single shader core would be busy while thousands of other shader cores in our GPU are doing nothing. Therefore we split the double sum into two sums in our implementation. First we compute the row averages. This can be performed in parallel. Each shader core is responsible for one row and sums up the values in the x direction. And then we have another shader that iterates over the y direction and computes our average. Ok, let's copy the grayscale shader and rename it to Row Average. This shader produces an output for each row, 
so the output width is 1 and the height is 512. I paste a few helper functions that we have used before. P to T converts from pixel to texture coordinates. T to P converts from texture coordinates to pixels. Round to integer rounds to the nearest integer value. Float sum equals 0, 0.0. We need to know for which row the shader call is responsible for. This is encoded in the texture coordinate T, which we can get by tc.t or tc.y, whatever you prefer. Then we convert texture coordinates to pixels. T to P, tc.y, input image height. And round to the nearest integer value, int y equals round to integer. So the value of y gives us the row for which this shader call is responsible. We compute the sum over the x direction. For int x equals 0, x less than input image with x++. Plus plus. Float gray equals texel fetch input image ivec 2 xy 0 dot r. Sum plus equal gray. We have not used the function texel fetch until now. It is similar to the known texture LOD function. The only difference is that the second parameter is an integer vector iVec2 instead of a float vector Vec2. The third parameter is a level of detail, which in our case is zero, so we are indexing into the highest resolution. With texel fetch we always get the original pixel content and don't have to worry about the interpolation setting of the texture. Dot R means that we are using only the red channel here. Once we have summed up the row values, we need to divide by the total number of pixels in x direction. Sum divide equal float input image width. Out color equals vec4 sum 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 1.0. Apply and close. The output image has a size of 1 times 512 pixels. So it is displayed as a very thin line here. I will now increase the width to improve the visibility. Let's say to 40. Of course this is only temporary for the visualization in the GSN Composer. In practice a width of 1 is sufficient. Let's put the grayscale and the row average output side by side down here. Ok, it looks like our shader is working. Here we have dark rows and we get a dark row average. Here are the bright light sources and we get high values for these row averages. Down here we have medium values and the row averages have a medium gray. Next we compute the image average. We clone the row average shader and rename it to column average. The size of the output image is 1 by 1 pixel. Therefore this shader is called only once for the single output pixel. We connect the row average image to the input image slot. Now we need to swap x and y. int x tc.x input image width. Iterate over the y direction. For int y equals 0, y less than input image height, y++. plus plus. Input image height. Everything else stays the same. Apply code and close. Ok, this is our average grayscale value for the input image. We now have to divide each pixel of the grayscale image by the average to compute the joint PDF. We copy the grayscale shader and rename it to Division. The implementation is very easy. Uniform sampler to the A, min filter equals nearest, mag filter equals nearest. Uniform sampler to the B, min filter equals nearest, mag filter equals nearest. We have set the interpolation filter to nearest because we want to turn off interpolation and midmap filtering of the input textures. Float A equals texture A TC dot R. Float B equals texture B TC dot R. Float C equals zero. If apps B, 
greater than 1 to the power of minus 8 to prevent division by 0, c equals a divided by b. Out color equals vec4 c c c 1.0. Apply and close. Now we connect the grayscale image and the average to get the joint PDF. The output size is 1024 times 512. To make sure that we have not made any mistake, we use the built-in average node. Image processing, compute, reduce, average, and check the result. Perfect, the image average is 1, as expected. Ok, step 2 is done, we have the joint PDF. Step 3, calculate the marginal PDF for one dimension. We can compute the marginal PDF with respect to S or T here. We select T. Therefore we need to solve integral from 0 to 1 of P of S and T dS. We put in the grayscale image divided by the image average as the joint PDF. Average A is the constant value that can be pulled out. Then we use the Riemann sum again to solve the remaining integral. This is the result. We can see that this part is the same as the formula for the row averages. This means that we just have to divide the row averages by the image average and we have the marginal PDF. We copy the division shader. Rename the output to PDF marginal. Connect the row average image and the average. And set the size to 40 times 512. Again, we use 40 only for the visualization. A width of 1 pixel is all that we need in practice. Step 4. Calculate the conditional PDF for the other dimension. The conditional PDF P of S given T is equal to the joint PDF divided by the marginal PDF PT of T. The joint PDF is the grayscale image divided by the average. For the marginal PDF we put in the formula from the previous slide. Ok, as we can see here, the average A is cancelled out. So we just need to divide the grayscale image by the row averages. We copy the division shader. Rename the output to PDF conditional. Connect the grayscale image to input A and the row averages to input B. Now let's inspect the output. Here in the middle, where we have the bright light sources, it looks a bit suspicious. Why are these rows so dark? Remember that this is a conditional PDF. These dark rows show up at the locations of the bright light sources, which emit much more radiance than other pixels in the same row. Therefore, under the condition that we have randomly selected one of these rows, we should sample at the location of the bright light sources and not somewhere else. Whereas down here at the road, it does not matter so much where we place the samples. For example, under the condition that we have randomly selected this row, it does not matter so much where to place the sample in the x direction. It is better to place it here than there, because the conditional PDF is a bit higher but the difference is not that big. Step 5. Apply inverse transform sampling. To perform inverse transform sampling for our 2D PDF, we need to compute the CDF for the marginal density and for the conditional density. Let's first look at the CDF for the marginal density. Here is again the marginal PDF small pt of t from step 3. The row averages are divided by the image average. The marginal PDF PT of Y is this image here. The row averages are divided by the image average. 
Remember that this image has a width of 1 pixel. We put 40 pixels just for the visualization, so it is a function of y only. The corresponding cumulative distribution function CDF capital PT of t is computed by the integral from 0 to t of small pt of t tilde dt tilde. Again, this integral can be approximately solved with the Riemann sum. This is the CDF. To apply inverse transform sampling, we need the inverse of the CDF. However, the CDF cannot be inverted because it is not an analytic function. Instead, this function is represented by discrete pixels stored in the texture. Given a uniformly distributed random variable u in the range from 0 to 1, we want to invert this equation u equals capital PT of y. We would like to have the inverted function y equals some function of u. This is not possible analytically. However, the shader can perform this addition over y tilde here until u is reached. The corresponding y where the addition has stopped is the image row where the sample is taken. Let's implement this shader that computes the inverse CDF from the marginal PDF. We copy the column average shader and rename it to CDF marginal inverse. We connect the marginal PDF and set the size to 40 times 512 pixels. Ideally, we want to pre-compute the inverse of the CDF for every u in the range from 0 to 1. The texture coordinate t in y direction goes from 0 to 1, so we can use it for our u. Float u equals tc.y. This means that we pre-compute the inverted CDF for as many values as our output image has pixels in the y direction. We move the definition of int y outside of the loop, int y u is equal to the sum divided by t, and t is the image height here, divide by float input image height. We need to perform the addition over y until the sum reaches u. If sum greater equal u, break. We convert the resulting y coordinate from pixels to a texture coordinate in the range from 0 to 1. Float CDF y inf equals p to t float y input image height. Outcolor equals vec4 CDF y inverse CDF y inverse CDF y inverse 1.0. Apply code and close. Excellent, we have pre computed the inverse of the marginal CDF for 512 values of u. This is not perfect, and there are obviously small errors due to the quantization of u. If we want more values and less quantization error, we can simply increase the height here, say to 2000. But let's stay within the original height of 512, which is usually sufficient in practice. I should mention that we make a small systematic error because we break the loop here if the sum is greater than or equal to u. So we don't select the nearest neighbor in y direction, but always the larger pixel location in y direction. There is a paper from 2012 by Matt Farr and Greg Humphreys about sampling environment maps that is called Monte Carlo Rendering with Natural Illumination. You can find a link in the video description. The authors suggest using a piecewise linear function. Please follow their paper if you need this accuracy. I have decided against implementing linear interpolation here because it makes the code a bit more complex. Furthermore, our selected y values are always on the pixel grid and we don't have to worry about texture interpolation. Now that the image row capital Y of the sample value was found, the conditional PDF PSS given T must be used to find the image column. I've written it down in a formal way on this slide, but we can see here that we have to solve a similar problem again as we did on the previous slide. So instead of iterating over the marginal PDF in y direction, we now need to iterate over the conditional PDF in x direction. We copy the row average shader and rename it to CDF conditional inverse. Connect the conditional PDF and set the size to 1024 times 512.
float u equals tc.x. Define x outside of the loop. Int x. Divide by float input image width. If sum greater equal u, break. Float cdfx inf equals p2t float x input image width. Apply code and close. Ok, we have reached the last step. Step 6, use the samples to evaluate the rendering equation. Here is the integral that we want to solve. This is the important sampling sum. Here is the sum with the additional 2 pi squared factor from the reparameterization to texture coordinates s and t. Let's put in a diffuse BRDF, which is given by the surface albedo rho d divided by pi. Pi is cancelled out. And we can move the constant rho d in front of the sum, to pi as well. This complete term, except for the factor rho d, is now pre-computed and stored in the pre-filtered environment map. During real-time rendering, we can then perform shading by looking up the direction of the surface normal in the pre-filtered environment map and multiplying by the surface albedo rho d, just like in episode number 10. Only now, our pre-filtered environment map is sampled with respect to the incoming radiance from the environment map and not with respect to the BRDF. Let's copy the BRDF sampling solution from here and see what we need to change. BRDF sampling nfmap sampling We don't need mipmaps anymore. In fact, we want no interpolation of the input pixel values at all. So we use my texture min filter equals nearest, mac filter equals nearest. Then we need the joint PDF uniform sampler 2D PDF joint min filter equals nearest, mac filter equals nearest. The precomputed inverse of the CDF of the marginal PDF in y direction uniform sampler 2D CDF y inf min filter equals nearest, mac filter equals nearest. And the precomputed inverse of the CDF of the conditional PDF in x direction. Uniform sampler to d CDF x inf, min filter equals nearest, mac filter equals nearest. We need the normal, but we are sampling directly in the global coordinate system, so we don't need this transformation into the normal space. Ok, here in the sampling loop we generate uniformly distributed samples and we have the choice of pseudorandom, Hammersley or Halton. Currently Halton is active. The next two lines are for the important sampling with respect to the BRDF and we need to replace them. Instead we perform inverse transform sampling using the pre-computed inverse of the CDF for Y. Float sample Y equals texture CDF Y inf vec2 0.5 random.y.r. Now we know where to sample in the y direction. Next we use the pre-computed inverse of the CDF of the conditional PDF to get the x location. Float sample x equals texture CDF x inf vec2 random.x sample y dot r. Vec2 sample location equals Vec2 sample x sample y. First, let's add the option to debug the sample location. Uniform bool debug. Description enable debugging for sampling locations. Default value equals false. To draw small circles at the sample positions, I copy the SDF circle drawing functions from episode number 7. If debug result.r plus equals fill circle text 
Sample Location 0.003. Sample Location is the center of the circle, 0.003 is the radius. Okay, this will draw a red circle for each sample location. Else, we comment out all these lines for now. Let's put the original environment map in the background. If debug vec3 background equals min texture env map sampler text.rgb 0.2. We clamp to a maximal value of 0.2 here. Result equals mix background result result.r. Result.r is our mixing weight. If there is a circle, result.r is larger than 0 and we mix in the circles. Otherwise, we use the background. Else, result equals result divided by float n. Only divide by n here if we are not in the debug case. Apply code and close. We connect all textures. Okay, this looks very good. We are taking a lot of samples at the bright light sources and only a few samples everywhere else. Let's finish the implementation. We need the radiance at the sample location. Vec3 radiance equals texture and map sampler sample location dot RGB and the joint PDF at the sample location. Float PDF equals texture PDF joint sample location dot R. The direction of the sample location in the world coordinate system. Vec3 pos world equals spherical env map to direction sample location. Now we compute the cosine of the angle between the surface normal and the incoming light direction with the dot product. Float cosine theta equals dot normal world. If cosine theta greater than 0 and PDF greater than 0, we compute theta in the coordinate system of the environment map. The mapping is given by float theta equals pi times 1.0 minus sample location dot t. And implement our final sampling equation from the slides. Result plus equal 2.0 times pi times radians times cosine theta times sine theta divided by the PDF. Down here we divide by n. Let's see what we have. Well, this is pretty convincing. Let's compare it to BRDF sampling. At the top is the result with BRDF sampling and at the bottom is the result with environment map sampling. The environment map sampling is much better here. We currently use 1000 samples for both approaches. Let's see how many samples we need. This is just one sample. We just get the bluish green light from the window. This is two samples. We also sample the location of the street lamp and we get its orange light contribution. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. With only 100 samples, we get a very nice result. Let's use pseudo random instead of Halton sampling. Apply code, recompute. This makes the result a bit more noisy, so we better stick with Halton. Let's increase the mipmap level for the BRDF sampling, because that was the trick that we used before. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, 5 is maybe the maximum. Well, for the diffuse part of the BRDF, nfmap sampling is clearly better. Let's also try this easier low frequency nfmap. Also good. We sample more in the bright sky than on the ground, which makes sense. 
Despite our good results here, it is usually better to use BRDF sampling for narrow, specular lobes. If you want to get the best of both approaches automatically, you can combine both sampling strategies using a technique called multiple important sampling. The main idea of multiple important sampling is to weight samples from both strategies based on their PDFs. Okay, that's it for today. We have discussed and implemented a long chain of several shaders to achieve our goal. If you have any questions, use the comments or get in contact with me. As always, if you prefer C++ or Java source code, this can be found in the video description. See you in the next episode of Shaders Monthly.